Hello, my name is Kate Gay. I'm a settler woman and archivist who lives and was raised in Acacia territory in the traditional land of the Willaday Yellowknife Stene. I would like to thank Erica, Zoe, and Joseph for organizing this project to make the TRC summary more accessible. I'm honored today to read the language and culture section, pages 80 to 84 of the executive summary of the Truth and Reconciliation Report. Language and culture, quote, the Indian language is indeed seldom heard in the institution, end quote. The government's hostile approach to Aboriginal languages was reiterated in numerous policy directives. In 1883, Indian Commissioner Edgar Dudney instructed Battleford School Principal Thomas Clark that great attention was to be given to, quote, towards imparting a knowledge of the art of reading, writing, and speaking the English language rather than that of Cree, end quote. In 1889, Deputy Minister in, of Indian Affairs, Lawrence Van Kugnet, informed Bishop, Bishop Paul Dereux that in the new Cranbrook British Columbia School, mealtime conversations were to be, quote, conducted, conducted exclusively in the English language, end quote. The principal was also to set a fixed time during which Aboriginal languages could be spoken. In 1890, the Indian Commissioner Hayter Reed proposed, quote, at the most, native language is only to be used as a vehicle of teaching and should be discontinued as soon, such as soon as practicable, end quote. English was to be the primary language of instruction, quote, even where French is taught, end quote. The Indian Fairs Program of Studies for Indian Schools of 1893 advised, quote, Every effort must be made to induce pupils to speak English and teach them to understand it. Unless they do, the whole work of the teacher is likely to be wasted." End quote. Principals regularly reported in their success in suppressing Aboriginal languages. In 1887, Principal E. Claude boasted that his 30 students at the High River School, quote, all understand English passably well and few are unable to express themselves in English. They talk English in recreation. I scarcely need to co any coercive means to oblige them to do so." End quote. In 1898, the Kamloops principal reported that, quote, English is the only language used at all times by, pe the, by the pupils, end quote. That same year, the Mission British Columbia principal wrote, quote, English is the common language of the school. The Indian language is indeed seldom heard in the institution, except with the newly arrived pupils." End quote. The 1898 report from the principal of the Anglican School at Onion Lake indicated that the school was one of the few exceptions. There, the children were taught to, quote, read and write both Cree and English, end quote. Inspectors viewed the continued use of Aboriginal languages by the students as a sign of failure. The principal of the Red Deer School was taken to task in 1903 by an inspector who felt that a, quote, serious drawback to schoolwork, as well as an evidence of bad discipline, was the use of the Cree language, which was quite prevalent, end quote. This policy of language suppression continued well into the 20th century. After a 1935 tour of Canada, Oblate Superior General Theodore Laboure expressed concern over the strict enforcement of prohibitions against speaking Aboriginal languages. In his opinion, quote, the forbidding of children to speak Indian, even during recreation, was so strict in some of our schools that any lapse would be severely punished to the point that children were led to consider it a serious offense, end quote. Students had strong memories of being punished for speaking Indian. Mary Angus, who attended the Battleford School in the late 19th century, said that students caught speaking their own language were to be given a close haircut. Quote, all the haircut to be as a man, that what they do, for us not to talk. We were afraid of that, to have our haircut, end quote. 
at the Fraser School in British Columbia, Fraser Lake School in British Columbia, Mary John James, pardon me, Mary John said she could speak her own language only in whispers. Melvina McNabb was seven years old when she was enrolled in the File Hills School and, quote, I couldn't talk a word of English. I taught Cree and I was abused for that, hit, and made to try to talk English, end quote. Raymond Hill, who was a student at the Mohawk Institute in Brantford in the early years of the 20th century, said, quote, I lost my language. They threatened us with a strapping if we spoke it, and within all a year I lost all of it. They said they thought we were talking about them, end quote. Language use often continued in secret. Mary England recalled that while Aboriginal languages were banned at the mission school in the early 20th century, children would spill, still speak it to one another. Clyde Peters said he stopped speaking his Aboriginal language at the Mount Elgin School after he found out the school punished students for doing so. Quote, I never got the strap but for it, but I was warned enough that I didn't do it. End quote. Even after that, he and his friends would speak to each other when they thought no one else could hear them. Quote, when we'd go up in the dormitories in the evening, I had a friend from Sarnia who I could talk with. End quote. Many of the students came to the school fluent in Aboriginal language, with little or no understanding of French or English. This trend continued well into the post-war period. For these children, the first few months in school were disorienting and frightening. Arthur McKay arrived at the Sandy Bay Manitoba School in the early 1940s with no knowledge of English. Quote, they told me not to speak my language and everything, so I always pretended to be asleep at my desk so they wouldn't ask me anything." End quote. Peter Nakobe recalled being punished for writing in his notebook in Cree syllabics at the Fort Albany, pardon me, Fort Albany School, Ontario School. Mika Ali Vaktuk came to the Pangar Tung School in what is now Nunavut with no knowledge of English. When she failed to obey an instruction because she did not understand it, she was slapped on the hands. Quote, that's how my education began, end quote. On his first day of school in Pangnertung, the teacher overheard Sam Kautinuk speaking to his friend in Anuktitut. Quote, he took a ruler and grabbed my head like this and then smacked me in the mouth with the ruler four times." End quote. At the Capel School in the mid-1960s, Greg Rainville said he was punished for failing to carry out instructions given to him in a language that he did not understand. Quote, the nuns would get frustrated with you when they talk to you in French or English, and you're not knowing what they're talking about, and you're pulled around by the ear. End quote. At the Shubin Akadi School, a staff member once caught William Herner, Herney speaking Micmac with his brother. She strapped him and then washed his mouth out with soap. Alphonse Mc, McNeely when, underwent the same punishment at the Roman Catholic School in Aklavik in the 1940s. Pierrette Benjamin said she was forced to eat soap at the Latouk School. Quote, the principal, she put it in my mouth, and she said, eat it, eat it. End quote. The language policy disrupted families. When John Kistabish left the Amos Quebec school, he could no longer speak Algonquin, and his parents could not speak French, the language that he had been taught in school. As a result, he found it almost impossible to communicate with them about the abuse that he experienced at school. Quote, I had tried to talk with my parents, and no, it didn't work. We were, well, anyway, because I knew that they were my parents, when I left, left the residential school, that the communication wasn't there." End quote. Culture was attacked as well as language. In his memoirs, Stony Chief John Snow tells of how at the Morley, Alberta school, the, quote, education consisted of nothing that had any relationship to our homes and culture. Indeed, Stony culture was condemned explicitly and implicitly, end quote. He recalled being taught that the only good people on earth were non-Indians, and specifically white Christians. Andrew Bullcalf recalled that at residential school in Cardston, Alberta, 
Students were not only punished for speaking their own languages, but they were also discouraged from participating in traditional cultural activities. Evelyn Kelman recalled that it, the principal at the Brockett Alberta School warned students that if they attended a sun dance that was to be held during the summer, they would be strapped on their return to school. Marilyn Buffalo recalled being told by the Havamut Alberta School staff that the sun dance was devil worship. One year, Sarah McLeod returned to the Kamloops school with a miniature totem pole that a family member had given her for her birthday. When she proudly showed it to one of the nuns, it was taken from her and thrown out. She was told that it was nothing but devilry. School officials did not limit their opposition to Aboriginal culture to the classroom. In 1942, Gula'ishan Alberta principal John House became involved in the campaign to have two Blackfoot chiefs deposed, in part because of their support for traditional dance ceremonies. In 1943, F.E. Anfield, the principal of the Alert Bay British Columbia School, wrote a letter encouraging former students not to participate in local potlatches, implying that such ceremonies were based on outdated superstition and led to impoverishment and family neglect. Even when it did not directly disparage Aboriginal culture, the curriculum undermined Aboriginal identity. Thadi Andre, who attended the Satil Quebec school in the 1950s, recalled as a, how as a student he wanted to, quote, resemble the white man, and then in the meantime, they are trying by all means to strip you of who you are as an Innu. When you are young, you are not aware of what you are losing as a human being. End quote. It was not until the 1960s that attitudes began to change about the ab place of Aboriginal language and culture in residential schools. Alex Alika Shuak said that at the Churchill School, which operated in the 1960s, there were no restrictions on the use of Aboriginal languages. He recalled, quote, the only time, real time, we spoke English was when we were in the classroom or were talking to one of the administration staff and or somebody from town that's not Inuit, but otherwise we, everybody spoke our language, end quote. The Canadian Welfare Council's 1967 report on nine Saskatchewan residential schools described, quote, an emphasis on relating course content to the Indian culture as, quote, imaginative and a sign of progress and, quote, making the educational experience meaningful for the Indian child, end quote. By 1968, the Roman Catholic school in Cardston was incorporating Blackfoot into its educational program. In some schools, Aboriginal teachers were brought in to teach dancing and singing. However, as late as the 1969-70 school year, there were only seven Indian Affairs schools that offered courses in the Aboriginal languages or used Aboriginal languages as the language of instruction. Despite the encouragement, that was offered in some schools and the students' efforts to keep their language alive, the overall impact was language loss. Of her experiences at the Baptist School in Whitehorse and the Anglican School in Carcross, Dorothy, pardon me, Rose Dorothy Charlie said, quote, they took my language. They took it right out of my mouth. I never spoke it again, end quote. In some cases, the residential school experience led parents not to decide not to teach their children an Aboriginal language. Both of Jolene Husky's parents attended residential school in the Northwest Territories. As a result of their experience in the schools, they raised their daughter to speak English. When Bruce DeMont was sent to residential school in Onion Lake, Saskatchewan, his mother warned him not to speak Cree. <laughs> 